Hello all, welcome back to once again to another interesting story under the Ajadi Kamath Mahasa story series by Mommy Shomis. Today, before I start my story, I want to say heartfelt thank you for all of you for supporting me, encouraging me in the, in my in the story marathon under the Ajadi Kamath Mahasa story series. Today is the 50th episode, which means that we have completed three fourths of our uh, journey under this story marathon. Uh, the, it's it's mainly because of all your love, encouragement, and patronage for my videos that I'm able to complete my journey so far. And I re uh, humbly request you all to support me um, going forward in my future journey as well. So now let us come back to today's story. Today I'm going to introduce you to a king who has really understood the need for having a unified Telugu-speaking people. I'm not talking about Akanda Bharat. The moment I, uh, the king whom I'm going to refer today is the Telugu king, and he felt the need for having all the Telugu kingdoms work under uh, seamlessly under one single umbrella. And he, uh, the moment I say Telugu king, most of the people remember Gautami Putra Satakarni or the Satavahanas, who is the first uh, um, uh, emperor from the Telugu, uh, uh, I mean, Andhra Pradesh. They are Telugu speaking region who has uni unified most of the kingdoms uh, uh, and got them all under the Akanda Bharat umbrella. No, I'm not talking about Gautami Putra Satakarni or Satavahanas here. I'm talking about the Kakatiyas and uh, I'm going to talk uh, introduce you to the Mah uh, Maharaja Ganapati Deva. The moment I say Kakatiyas, most of the people think that they are some feudal lords or the army chieftains who ruled uh, some part of Andhra Pradesh for a certain time and then disappeared into the history. It's not like that, my dear friends. The, though they are, they had started as the feudal lords, they had ruled Andhra Pradesh for more than you know, 300 years and expanded the uh, boundaries of their kingdom right from the heart of the Andhra Pradesh around the Telangana region into Maharashtra, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, everywhere. So before we speak about Maharaja Ganapati Deva, who has taken Kakatiya kingdom to its peak or to its zenith, let us understand from where the entire Kakatiya dynasty has originated, how it, uh, their rules have started uh, in the history. Uh, during 11th century, it, the and most of the southern part of India is being ruled by Eastern Chalukyas. At that point of time, the um, Telugu speaking land is divided into multiple small, small kingdoms. Each kingdom is maybe of a, some distant uh, area or maybe bigger than a little, little bit about it, uh, equal to two districts in the current uh, uh, geographical manner, if you want to uh, state it. So, um, and these small, small kings or the feudal laws used to fight a lot among themselves for their supremacy. And all these kings used to pay taxes to Vishen Chalukyas. But uh, during the middle of 11th century, the Asian Chalukyas influence was on a uh, little decline. And that is when some of these feudal laws started uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, establishing their own sovereignty, started declaring themselves as kings. And the first person whom we know as the originator of Kakatiya dynasty is Beta Raju, who is actually a feudal lord working under Eastern Chalukyas during the 11th century. And his offspring, Rudra Deva, I mean, maybe the, the third or fourth ruler from the Kakatiya dynasty is the person who has declared his sovereignty from Eastern Chalukyas and who declared himself as a king. And at that point of time, he has a very small region under his control, which he expanded uh, to cater to the, most of the Telangana and Andhra Pradesh regions by uniting all the Telugu speaking kings who were in his vicinity. And he was not waging wars at that point of time, but he was convincing the people mostly about the need for uh, having a unified kingdom because of, uh, we need to prepare ourselves for facing the biggest enemy who, who are nothing but the Afghanistanis, the Turkish, in uh, Turks, and the uh, Uzbekistani people who are coming, in, Mughals, all these people are coming and invading Delhi Sultanate at that point of time and establishing their territories, right? So when they are expanding, the news is traveling, even though these people are in down South India, the news is traveling and people are afraid of the uh, atrocities being done by the different uh, inv invaders who are invading India at that point of time. So 
just by the word of i mean negotiations he was able to expand his territory and he is a very good scholar sanskrit scholar as well he has written so many books in sanskrit so he knew the importance of having a mother tongue and mother tongue is the one thing which unifies or um, i mean brings all the people together on a single platform and so he was stressing that fact all the time and he was from he was a big pattern of uh, the poets authors and all the sculptures and other uh, weavers and everybody um, but uh, then after uh, rudradeva the next ruler who is very prominent in the kakriya dynasty is the ganapati deva ma ganapati deva ma, uh, is the one who has taken kakriya dynasty to its zenith he was he went he went on waging wars as well with the kings from the neighboring kings from maharashtra odisha karnataka tamil nadu and he was actually able to expand his territory to to a large extent and not only that he, he, he is not just a war loving king who expanded his territory but he is a very good administrator also at that point of time in the telugu speaking land the most prominent goods which the, the entire telugu speaking land was producing all the uh, pro, uh, cotton products like sarees um, clothes which are being really sought by the foreign uh, um, uh, in uh, traders and also the diamonds and then the regular cereals and uh, spices and st stuff like that so as soon as he became the emperor of kakatiya dynasty ganapati deva understood the need uh, of for having a good trading system in his uh, kingdom and he understood that most of the local, small small kings who are till now ruling the different parts of andhra pradesh were talk, um, collecting exorbitant taxes from these european traders because of which the european trade with the uh, andhra pradesh uh, telugu speaking land is being is getting reduced drastically but whereas the telugu speaking land has a such a huge coastline where people european traders can come and uh, po, uh, dock their ship any in any port and they can trade their goods and uh, by encouraging these european traders he would be able to get more money into his kingdom which he can definitely utilize for the benefit of the people so the first thing was so that he has taken over the control of the uh, kakatiya empire he has banned all the trading taxes and he's uh, given us i mean basically a platform for all the european traders to come trade peacefully and go and he's given all the comforts for them uh, not as a cost of the people who are selling the goods from his kingdom and he was also taking care of the people who are selling all the goods and next thing he's done is he shifted his capital from um, uh, hanumakonda which is a small village <coughs> near hyderabad to current varangal which is once again in telangana region <coughs> he understood the need for having a fortified city as the capital city because he is already aware of the muslim the in uh, muslim invasion the turkish invasion that's happening up in the northern india he realized that if his people have to be safe his city should, his city should be fortified uh, and he was such an excellent master planner that he in, got all the workers and got the work done i'm not saying that he is the one architect who's done it but he is a savvy architect and designed the fort in such a way that the fort will have four circular uh, i mean uh, circles uh, around it and the first as soon as the first circular wall is crossed then you will see all the people and the agricultural land surrounding that and to for the agriculture uh, to sustain the agriculture to meet the needs of the agriculture he has dug a lot of um, um, tanks so that those tanks can supply water to all the agricultural lands and then beyond that there is a big moat which is surrounded with water next to wall um, and after the moat is a second wall where once when you enter all the people of the city will be living in there so people will go cross a uh, uh, wall to enter into their agricultural lands uh, do the agriculture and come back to the internal wall and then the fourth wall uh, is a place where the actual fort lies and all the people are being secured in such a way that they are not afraid of any invasions they are not afraid of any decoys or thugs at that point of time remember we're talking about the 11th century so which is very common right most of uh, indian uh, subcontinent is uh, 
under thick forest, people are, decoys are coming, looting the people, innocent people are getting killed and all that stuff. So he thought all these things that about the safety of his people and he's built, he started building that current Warangal fort, which we see in Warangal today. And mo of course, most of the fort has been destroyed during the um, Turkish invasion, during the Afghani invasion, and then earthquakes and all that other stuff. But still, the walls of today's fort stands as a huge testimonial about the futuristic thought of Ganapati Deva, how he thought about the, benefit, uh, the safety of his own people. Not only that, my dear friends, he is also a huge pattern of culture, literature, arts, fine arts, everything. He has built Ramapa Temple. And you think the Rampa temple has Lord Rama as the main deity? No, this is the only one and unique temple in throughout India where the temple has been named after the main sculptor who has designed and constructed this temple. Surprising, isn't it? He is none other than the sculptor Ramappa. Ramappa is originally from Karnataka, but he has been called here uh, to, and sought his, uh, and Ganpati Deva sought his help in constructing this temp beautiful temple called Ramappa Temple, which houses uh, Lord Shiva as the main deity. Of course, there are multiple small, small other uh, temples within this uh, entire temple complex. And you know, there's so much architectural wonder, so much marvelous features that Ramapa temples even boast till today. Do you know what is the uh, foundation that they have used in this building the Ramapa temple? The normal bricks? No, my dear friends, you are wrong. They have used floating bricks as the foundation, base of the foundation, because they know when the area is totally I mean, under the pathway of the Godavari River and Krishna River and all that stuff, underneath the ground, down below the ground, water is flowing and there can be a lot of other damage that can happen. So they use lightweight floating bricks as the foundation stone, foundation bricks for this huge temple. And the sculptures that are been done on this uh, temple are so marvelous. And in fact, based on the sculptures, one of the recent dance, um, uh, dance masters have composed the entire Perini dance form, which was existing in 11th century, but got um, disappeared from the minds of the people because we all know that how and most of the education, most of the knowledge in, in the Indian in the Indian history gets passed on in the form of the oral tradition. And because of that oral tradition, the Perni dance form has been completely erased from the minds of the people. But one of the recent, uh, uh, re, uh, recently, one of the dance masters have recomposed the Perni dance form just purely based on the sculptures that are available on the temple walls. That itself shows the uh, depth of the sculptures, the beauty of the sculptures, the magnanimity of the way uh, these sculptures have done everything. And you know what? Most of the thing, these things have been done on a single rock. And that is one more the reason why people call the capital city as Oru Gallu. Oru means one, Gallu means stone. So Oru Gallu means one stone. And another reason what they say is that uh, the Ramlinga, uh, the uh, Lord Shiva, the main deity, which is be, which is being seen in the Ramapa temple, is a uh, is a swaimbu stone that is like not the man-made stone, but a swaimbu stone that people, I mean, Ganapati Deva or one of his, uh, um, I mean, army people have found it I, uh, during their one of their uh, outings, and that is a and that stone proved to be very lucky for them, and that's why they had named it as Urugallu. So these are the two different theories that float around the name of that capital city. But whatever it may be, the Ramapa temple still stands tall for us as a big testimonial of the sculptures, okay? sculpture, the magnificent beauty which the sculptors are able to uh, uh, elicit out of the single huge, huge boulders and the granite stones. Uh, imagine how the time that uh, these people have taken to build this temple. It is noted in the history that it take it had taken them sixty years to build this temple. The patience is uh, the patience and the dedication which these sculptures have shown is tremendous, isn't it? Not only that, Tikkana Somayaji, the person who has uh, completed the, uh, I mean. Uh, completely written uh, Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam into Telugu. I mean, he uh, belongs to Ganapati Deva's time and he has taken shelter in Ganapati Deva's court and he has completed uh, the writing part of the 
ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಹಿ ಕೆನ್ ಐ ದರ್ಡ್ ಆದರ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಸೇ ಪೋಯೆಟ್ ಹೂ ಹಸ್ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಕನ್ವರ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸಾಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಇಂಟು ತೆಲುಗು ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ಆರ್ ನನ್ನಯ್ಯ ಅಂಡ್ ಟಿಕ್ಕನ್ ಟಿಕ್ಕನ್ ಐ ದ ತರ್ಡ್ ಒನ್ ಓಕೆ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ not only that at that point of the the weavers were so proficient in their skills that they were able to manufacture sarees that can fit into a match box now of course that trend has come up and now people are moving, getting these kind of sarees from the uh, those the small small villages near in varangal district like sirisilla and other areas but if that skill was existing even at that point of time and ganpati deva has given so much encouragement so much grants for all these weavers in the varangal district so that they, their families could flourish uh, doing what they love to do he is such a huge pattern of everything culture fine arts literature you name the field he is there he is giving grants for the people he is helping people to pl- excel in their uh, passions and he is helping the common public he is giving everything for them right good water security what is if no uh, king can uh, offer to his uh, people that shows that he is such an excellent noble administrator as well and he and we need to appreciate his thought of unifying the entire telugu speaking land under and getting it under one single umbrella so that there will not be any fights among them thus and they can work towards the betterment of the society which is in fact happening during his time and his has rani rudrama devi in the next hair i mean basically ganapati deva didn't have any son so his daughter rani rudrama devi has become the next queen of the kakatiya dynasty and we all know about her story how i mean there are so many movie also has come right and uh, unfortunately even she didn't have a son uh, so her daughter's son has is has become the next ruler of pratap rudra deva and with him the kakatiya dynasty has ended because alauddin khilji has come and taken him as a prisoner to delhi it seems because after the continuous wars with the kakatiya dynasty it seems the um our um, delhi sultanate has invaded varangal fort four times to loot all the diamonds that were present in the varangal fort and kohinoor diamond belongs to, uh, was found during the rani rudrama devi's period or pratap rudra deva's period on the river uh, river banks of the krishna river and alauddin khilji has taken this kohinoor diamond from pratap rudra deva to delhi sultanate and that is how the kohinoor diamond came into light and reached delhi and from there you know the journey of the kohinoor diamond right so kohinoor diamond belongs to andhra pradesh my dear friends it's okay where it belongs to where it ends up is another journey altogether that we can we need not have to worry too much and the history say I and mean, some people say that but though pratap rudra deva was captured as a prisoner in the last war with the delhi sultanate he has uh, committed a suicide because he couldn't i mean uh, ex- uh, go he couldn't see himself going to delhi as a prisoner and getting tortured for i mean uh, all the other uh, aspects uh, but some people say that no pratap rudra deva is not the last person from the kakatiya dynasty but actually Prat, um, pratap rudra deva's cousin has actually moved all the way from here to chatisgarh area and they started uh, the second rule of kakatiya uh, dynasty there in um, um, uh, chatisgarh and the la- the current ruler from that area ha- has come down to telangana to visit telangana see varangal fort recently so we don't know whether it that is true that part of the angle is true or it's been in, uh, like a uh, uh, some other person is um, uh, taking the credit of being associated with the kakatiya dynasty we don't know all those truths but historians some historians are giving credit to this person who has come down all the way from chatisgarh say stating that he is the next ruler of the kakatiya dynasty so that's all my dear friends is a story for today i hope you all liked it uh, the reason why i'm sh- sh- sharing this story is again once again with uh, the uh, because of the central theme which says that only if we are unified then only we can actually avoid all the attacks on us all the invasions on us and only when we stand united we can uh, flourish 
and that has been shown in reality by ganpati deva and that is the reason why i wanted to introduce that ganpati deva maharaja ganpati deva from kakatiya dynasty to you all hope you like this story let's meet tomorrow with another interesting story bye bye